Behold, a gateway to your own past, if you will. We meet at a college noted for knowledge, in a city noted for progress, in a state noted for strength. And we stand in need of all three. For we meet in an hour of change and challenge, in a decade of hope and fear, in an age of both knowledge and ignorance. The greater our knowledge increases, the greater our ignorance unfolds. History is strange, it's alien, and it won't give us what we would like to have. The West Coco Pharmacy bringing you hour three of the Tuesday morning on Bill Mick Live. It's the 12th of September, 2023. Good to have you along, and if it's the 8 o'clock hour of a Tuesday, Dave Bowman joins us from Silverdale, Washington, with Dave Does History. Today's edition, big ties to our lives here on the Space Coast because it goes back to the start of all of that. Good morning, Dave Bowman. How are things in Washington State this morning? Expensive, but otherwise good. <laughs> Expensive as well. That's pretty much everywhere, is it not? Yeah. Do you enjoy your NFL weekend, sir? No. I did not enjoy I'm a Broncos fan and a Giants fan. No, I did not have a good weekend at all. Mm, well, that could be tough. <laughs> you did enjoy watching. Yes, I did that. But okay, your, your guilty pleasure because is Because I out. don't have Spectrum. I have YouTube huh. TV, so I got everything. I'm getting recommendations all over for YouTube TV. I really am. Well, let me and know. And offer of a discount from my buddy Dave Bowman. Yes, save me some money on that. Absolutely. Well, I'll do my part whenever I make the de- I haven't made the decision yet. They did get it back in time last night for Monday Night Football. So I was able to catch, well, the beginning, and then I woke up for the very end. Yeah, about the same here. So. Yeah, not bad. Dave, we're going back to President Kennedy challenging the country to go to the moon and back within the decade. And it was already this day in 1962. So... Two years are pretty much gone in the decade. So eight years, we're going to the moon and back, and Kennedy pops this on the country, or did he? If you're one of those really pedantic people, it's actually almost three years. But I'm not going to get down that calendar argument. Go with that, yeah, exactly. Year zero or not. But, yeah, it was this day that Kennedy stood at Rice Stadium, Rice Football Stadium as it was called then, in Houston, Texas, and gave what is generally considered to be if not his best speech, certainly one of his most well-known speeches. It's a speech that is, it it resonates today. I mean, you can't listen to that speech today. It's 19 minutes long, by the way, if you want to listen to the whole thing. 19-minute speech, and, and yet it encapsulates so much of what America was trying to become and would actually become. Here's the thing about that speech, though. It contains that famous line, we choose to go to the moon. We choose to go to the moon in this decade and do the other things, not because they're easy, but because they're hard. And everybody in the audience goes crazy. Mm -hmm. And that's the part we get of that speech. And so there's this almost mythological assumption that that's the point where JFK stood up and announced that we were going to the moon, that that was the goal. Well, the problem is, that's not when he announced it. He had actually announced we were going to the moon more than a year before. So why this speech on September 12, 1962? What was it that caused him to say, well, we need to reiterate this, or I need to go to... Texas, of all places, to to do this, what what caused him to want to do that at that particular point? Now, I was not born yet. Why well, wasn't there the attention to the first speech nationally that there was to this one? Oh, there was. See, that's the part people don't get. There was a oh. lot of attention to the first announcement, <clears throat> okay. but, but somehow or another it gets subsumed, and we'll talk about that in just a minute. 1962, I wasn't born yet. I was actually born in 63, but I think you were around. I was. 62 was a very stressful year. You know, we talked last week about the start of the Cold War. 62, to that point, may have been absolutely the height of the Cold War. Might have been the most strenuous part. Now, Kennedy won't announce the Cuban Missile Crisis until October, so it's still a month or so away. Mm -hmm. But 
that's the announcement. That's when he goes on television and tells the American public what's going on. Believe me, as President Kennedy stands in Rice Stadium, Rice Football Stadium today, in 1962, he is fully aware that the Russians are putting nuclear missiles in Cuba. They know this. They not only know it, but they're debating what to do. And some of those suggestions about what to do are by what we would, you know, by our standards, what we would call insane, starting World War III over Cuba, those sorts of things. And one of the other things that's going on is that the Russians have abandoned the limited test ban, and they are firing off nukes again in the in the atmospheric test. And this is considered to be the ultimate in saber rattling. And one of the things that they have done in 1962 is they have set off what is known as the Tsar Bomba which you've probably heard of, or maybe you haven't. This is the largest atmospheric detonation of a nuclear device in the history of mankind. It is somewhere around 62 megatons, and it's scaled down from 100 megatons. In other words, they just build a two-thirds model of it. And this bomb, which you can see video of today, they've declassified, the Russians have declassified it, causes the United States to say, well, if you're going to do that, well, we're going to do something in reply. We pick it up in just 60 seconds on WMMB. Dave Bowman with us with Dave Does History as we're taking a look at Kennedy's speech to the country a year after he gave one to Congress about time to go to the moon and do it within this decade. Dave, where are we at? So after the Russians start testing their bombs again, including the Tsar Bomba, which if you haven't seen, you should Google that, T-S-A-R space B-O-M-B-A. It is a horrifying vision. After they do that, we decide, well, we're going to start testing atomic weapons again, and we conduct what is known as Operation Dominic, which is a series of nuclear tests, which includes three of, of particular note that I want you to get here. One is one of the, one is called the uh, shot Housatonic, which is the largest bomb of this test. It's just barely 10 megatons. Now remember, the Tsar Bomba was 62 megatons. Mm-hmm. We also do what's known as Operation Swordfish or Shot Swordfish, which is a a full-on atomic test of the Azrock anti-submarine rocket, which is a very small device designed to kill submarines. And there's some Famous video of that going off. But the biggest one we do, Bill, and this is the one that really sends the message, is shot Frigate Bird. And this is the only operational firing of a submarine-launched ballistic ballistic missile from a, from a submarine underwater, fires mm-hmm. an actually armed Polaris missile, flies downrange, and detonates. It's the only time that's ever happened. And, of course, the message to the Soviets is, this is what we can do. You want to play around? As someone said on your show yesterday, it's it's full-on FAFO here. Mm-hmm. We are also using Thor missiles, intercontinental ballistic missiles in this test, to send nuclear bombs up into the atmosphere, high-altitude detonations, to test that. So you can imagine what the what the stresses going on here are. We've got the space race going on. John Glenn has finally orbited the Earth this year. The, the Soviets have matched that with Vostok 3. It, it's, it, it's getting heated up there. You've got the Berlin crisis still going on. Uh, we, you know, we don't talk a lot about Berlin anymore, but when the Soviets divided Berlin in 61, it was a huge, huge deal and, and stressful. You've got a crisis in in Southeast Asia called the Laos crisis. Kennedy is starting to commit U.S. troops to Vietnam. Laos is in problems. And in South Africa, you've got Nelson Mandela being imprisoned. So all of this stuff is going on in the world, and people are looking around going, this is crazy. And then to top it all off, we all know about the 1960 U-2 incident, where the U-2 plane was shot down over the Soviet Mm -hmm. Union. Mm -hmm. We've got another one. Nobody ever talks about this one. But in early 1962, we have a U-2 from Taiwan that is shot down over China. Can you imagine that happening today? What oh, it would no. do? All of this is adding up. 
all of this is causing a lot of problems for the Kennedy administration and for the country as a whole. The stress is intense, and this atomic saber rattling really has people, I guess, fired up. And what what we don't really grasp today, the concept of the space race, getting into space first, getting to the moon first, comes with this almost unwritten undercurrent of militarization. Now, everybody keeps saying the reason we have NASA is because it's civilian. You know, we don't want to militarize space. But reality is, there is a tacit understanding that the first to conquer space is going to have a military advantage. And that is playing into everything as Kennedy goes to Texas in 1962. How interesting. And we will continue. See where Kennedy goes with the speech. We kind of see where it's landed us. I mean, we are the Space Coast after all. Dave Bowman joins us, and we'll uh, let you join us in our final segment uh, as we get to questions and commentary. But Dave's going to catch us up on this speech and how it uh, inspired a na- nation, changed a few minds maybe. We'll see where it goes. Well, we continue in just moments here on 92.7 FM WMMB. Surely the opening vistas of space promise high costs and hardships as well as high reward. So it is not surprising that some would have us stay where we are a little longer to rest, to wait. But this city of Houston, this state of Texas, this country of the United States was not built by those who waited and rested and wished to look behind them. Round the clock, live programming, when a storm hits, to the Stormwatch page on our website. WMMB is here before, during, and after the storm. It's Operation Stormwatch, brought to you by O'Galley Electric. The West Coco Pharmacy, this hour's sponsor of the show, is Dave Bowman joins us with Dave Does History on Bill Mick Live. Dave, as you noted, I was around in 1962, and had I known all of the uh, tumult that the country was in, I would ask mom and dad to get me back to the stork. I'd have been done. <laughs> However, um, we pressed forward, and Kennedy gets a lot of credit for this, and, and, and I think rightfully so. And I would point out, based on the discussion of the last hour, that John Kennedy was the youngest elected president in our history. He was not the youngest Teddy Roosevelt was, but he wasn't elected. He was right. You know, came into office after McKinley was assassinated. So just something to think about there in the big wide world. As we said, as he is standing there on September 12th, 1962, this is not the speech where he announces that we're going to the moon. That's not why he's there. It's not what he's encouraging people for. It's the, it's the quote, it's the pull quote from the speech, but it really isn't the thrust of the speech. Back in May 5th of 1961, over a year and a half earlier, We had launched Alan Shepard, Alan B. Shepard, into space for 15 minutes, Bill. 15 minutes up and down. That's it. That's the entirety of our manned space program in May of 1961. William Shepard's done that now. Yeah. Yeah, did his even last that long? I don't remember. Not quite, yeah. Anyway, on May 25th, 1961, 20 days later, John Kennedy stands in front of Congress for the annual State of the Union address and announces... Hey, we're going to the moon. We're building this Saturn V rocket. We're building the machines to do it. We're getting the people. We're going to the moon. In 1961, he tells Congress this. Congress likes this idea. They like it so much that they start spending money on this idea. They spend a buttload of money on this in 1961. They're like, yeah, let's go to the moon. Because, again... There's a lot of prestige here. There's a lot of military application, those kind of things. The problem is that the general reaction to that State of the Union address is very meh. The scientific community across the board, with the exception of Werner von Braun, is very negative. They don't see the point in going to the moon. The scientists, the the the, the schools that are going to be involved with this, in fact... There are newspaper articles around the country, I went and looked them up, 
where they just sort of say, well, it's a nice thing to think about, but that's very 21st century. That's, that's 50 to 100 years in the future. And in fact, some of them are even saying, this is impossible. Why would he even, why would he even waste money on this? We've got things here we need to spend money on. And so the public, which is reading the newspapers, because remember, this is the 60s, mm-hmm. and while some people might have watched it on television or heard it on radio, the vast majority are getting their information from newspapers. The public is really not on board with the idea of going to the moon. It's not that they're against it, but they don't really see any reason to do it. Why? Why go to the moon is the question that's asked over and over again. This is a very expensive thing. You're in the process of not quite starting a war in Southeast Asia, but, you know, it's getting the domino is, is, is being stacked up. Why do this is the question that is asked over and over and over again. Why go to the moon? All right, Dave, back at it. So why are we in Texas? Why does Kennedy go to Texas to deliver this speech? I mean, wouldn't it make more sense to do it in Florida? That's where we Yes, and from my mind, yes. The problem is they need a control center for all of this because Kennedy and, and the scientists recognize that Cape Canaveral is not going to be sufficient for controlling flights to and from the moon. They need a bigger space. They need water access. They need all of these things. So they start looking around the country. The number one choice, by the way, Bill, is a place called MacDill Air Force Base, which is in Florida, over by Mm -hmm. Tampa, Mm -hmm. as we know. This is a strategic air command base that that the Air Force doesn't need. They're getting ready to close. And so it looks like all the way into early 62 that MacDill is going to be the place. But then the, the Air Force for reasons that, you know, who knows what the Air Force is doing, decides that, no, we actually do need MacDill, probably because if we close it, people will say, well, then they don't need these other bases either. So they decide to keep it, which moves other places up the list that were down there. There are a lot of people from Massachusetts who are pushing hard to have this located in Massachusetts because, of course, Kennedy is from Massachusetts. And, of course, Lyndon Johnson, the vice president, is from Texas. And so he's lobbying hard. In reality, though, there's really only one place that has all the advantages that Tampa would have had without the, without the constant hurricane threat. And that is, of course, Houston, which is right there at Rice University, which we today don't necessarily think about. But Rice University, one of the leading uh, universities in in uh, space research and that sort of thing. And so it was chosen over MacDill, again, probably because of enormous influence from LBJ. But at mm-hmm. the same time, this is the place. And so that's how the Space Center, the what is now known as the Johnson Space Center, ends up in Houston. Kennedy goes there to give this speech. And he knows that this speech has to address all of the questions that have been a, being being asked for a year and a half. Why go to the moon? We've already set the goal. A president who sets really high-end goals. I mean, it wasn't that long ago that uh, we had a president who was a Bush, said we were going back to the moon. Then what happened? Everybody kind of went, mm, yeah, maybe. We've had presidents set these wild reach goals that everybody knows are just, you know, it's just politics. But Kennedy doesn't want this to be just politics. He wants this mission because he knows that there's prestige involved. He knows that it will demonstrate the superiority of the capitalist system over the communist system. He knows all this. But how do you convince a nation of this, and how do you do it in just 20 minutes? And that's the question. Why go to the moon? He reads his speech. He delivers his speech. Again, Kennedy was a master orator. And you've all heard that section. We choose to go to the moon. We choose to go to the moon in this decade and do the other things, not because they're easy, but because they are hard. Mm -hmm. 
and this, of course, is the part that this is the poll quote from the from the speech. Everybody knows that. And it's a brilliant piece of rhetoric. It's a brilliant piece of speechifying, if you will. I hate that word, but <laughs> it, it answers the question. Why are we going to the moon or does it? We choose to go to because it's not easy, because it is hard, because it will cost a lot of money. Later in the speech, he talks about how much money we're going to spend. we got to delve into this sentiment. Does it answer that question, why go to the moon? Or perhaps, is there a better answer? And we'll find out if there is as we wrap up Dave Does History in our final segment of Bill McLive for a Tuesday when we continue right here on 92.7 FM WMMB. Glad to have you along with us for this trip into history. William Bradford, speaking in 1630 of the founding of the Plymouth Bay Colony, said that all great and honorable actions are accompanied with great difficulties, and both must be enterprised and overcome with answerable courage. If this capsule history of our progress teaches us anything, it is that man in his quest for knowledge and progress is determined and cannot be deterred. The exploration of space will go ahead, whether we join in it or not. And it is one of the great adventures of all time. And no nation which expects to be the leader of other nations can expect to stay behind in this race for space. Call Bill now, 321-768-1240. Common Sense on Common Radio. And even less common with us pulling this thing on Tuesdays called Dave Does History. Dave Bowman with us as we take a look at the inception of America's space program and Kennedy's speech at Rice University in uh, 1962. Dave, the surprising thing is well received by Congress a year and a half earlier or thereabouts, a year and a few months earlier, and the country not necessarily buying it at this point. Well, it's the scientific community that's not buying it, and because they're not buying it, you know, the public is reading the papers. Oh, we were following the science. I right, love it. Right. They're reading these articles about, well, this is impossible. It's a waste of money. And Kennedy's speech in 1962 isn't to announce that we're going to the world, to the moon. Kennedy's speech is to answer the naysayers and at the same time issue that challenge that unites the country. Mm-hmm. And this is harder... You know, we think of it today as being hard. I don't know that today a politician could give such a speech. I really don't. If if any given president were to stand up and make such a speech as this, what would happen? You'd, you'd have the immediate, you know, opposition response. You would have the Internet going nuts about, oh, this president's crazy or that's not this or whatever. I don't know that you could find a president anymore that would unite the nation through a 20-minute speech. Kennedy has to answer that question, why go to the moon? And to do this, he actually says, we choose to go to the moon because it's difficult, and we do difficult things here. We're not doing this because it's easy. He goes on to quote William Bradford, who is, of course, um, you know, the Plymouth Bay Colony pilgrims, who said that all great and honorable actions are accompanied with great difficulties. Both must be enterprised and overcome with answerable courage. He goes on to kind of preview a later president when he says America has to be first. We have to be first at everything because if we're not first at everything, then we're not living up to what we're supposed to be. And then he gives what I consider to be the greatest answer to the question of why go to the moon. He pulls back into the recent memory. Remember, this is 1962. It's only been, what, five years since Edmund Hillary, who Hillary Clinton is named after, right, summited Mount Everest. That's a joke, by the way, for those of you not keeping up <laughs> at any rate. But it, was all, it wasn't that many years before that that the question had been asked, 
you know, why climb the highest mountain? Why go to the highest point? And George Mallory, who was the first man to, to really publicly try to do this, answered very simply, because it's there. Now, to us, that seems like a very flippant answer. But reality is much different. We're talking about a generation that had grown up with that. Why do we climb the highest mountain? Because it's there. And just a few years before, Edmund Hillary had done that. Why do we do these things and the other things, as Kennedy said? Not because they're easy, because they're hard, and because these challenges are there. And as we know today, this speech sets a fire under America. It motivates us. It answers the naysayers. You say it's impossible. The president says we can do it because it's there. Who are we going to believe? In the United States of America, this nation unites behind that goal, which, of course, is only reinforced a little over a year later when President Kennedy is killed. And we are determined to go to the moon, not because it's easy, but because it's there. We'll recap this, talk about the implications thereof, when we continue on Bill Mick Live in an hour, brought to you by the West Cocoa Pharmacy. Anything you may have missed in today's Bill Mick Live, you can pick it up in the podcast section of BillMick.com and the Bill Mick Live iHeartRadio channel. You can also catch up with Dave. His regular podcast is uh, Weekend What the Frock podcast, and uh, Dave does history.org all linked up for you on the show page today at BillMick.com, entitled Cable's Back Are You. Well, we are largely here at all, Dave, because of this speech the president gave. And now we are Florida's space coast. We're the country's space coast. And it all started with this idea. It, it really does. And, it, it, you know, it's a remarkable speech because some of the things that Kennedy talks about in 1962 are the fact that the Saturn V rocket is already being built. It's already designed. It's already being built and tested. We're going to push this forward. The Gemini program hasn't even begun yet. And we're already building the Apollo rocket. It's it's a remarkable thing to realize that, you know, it probably would have died out after Kennedy was assassinated. But let's give Lyndon Johnson some credit. He kind of revived that and said, you know, we're going to carry out his goal. We're going to do this by 1969. And because there was so much love, respect, and excitement about it, it was carried on. I think for me, the most remarkable part about the September 12th speech that Kennedy gave was the way he used the rhetoric, which is not a bad word, by the way, for those of you who think that is, the way he used the rhetoric, the way he used the emotion of the moment to respond to his naysayers. These days, if someone, if a president today gave a State of the Union speech and the scientific community or the political community or whoever poo-pooed the speech and started complaining about him what would he do he'd call a press conference and he'd point his finger at the camera and say those people are just no sayer naysayers or whatever kennedy didn't do that he knew what was coming he knew what was on the design board he knew that he had to motivate the people that if he could reach the people they would be behind it and so he stands there with that incredibly well crafted 19 minute speech and he answers that question why go to the moon because it's there, which is an argument that spoke to that generation in ways that it doesn't speak to us today. Today, that argument would never fly. But in 1962, everybody understood why that was so important. And it really, to me, it speaks to the idea that we talk about in free speech so often. Have a better argument. When someone says you're wrong, come up with a better argument. Don't just point your finger and complain. Mm -hmm. But today, I don't know. We look at the challenges we're facing today, even if you don't accept the science behind some of those things, is the do you see any president today who believes in global warming giving a speech like this that would motivate the American people? No. Not a chance. Health care. I mean, we watched the whole health care debacle from the 90s on. Nobody was ever able to really motivate the American people. 
they were able to arm twist some votes, but nobody ever really made this our moonshot, our next moonshot. The the goal was to get to the moon, and Kennedy, you know, he, he understood that. But he also understood that if you didn't answer that question, why, you weren't going to get any, you weren't going to get off the ground. And it was just uh, four years to the day later that Gemini 11 was the most successful Gemini mission flew, clearing the way for us to go to the moon. Very good. And all the innovation that's come after. Let's get to the phones, Dave. Line one, you're up on Bill Mick Live. Good morning. Hey, this is that guy, Keith, in uh, Palm Bay, Yucky. Uh, Florida. Hey, uh, just curious, what was the response of the Russians in between that, them two speeches? Were they moving in the direction of the moon? Or they, And on a side note, at the beginning, did you say the Russians were the cause of global warming with their 62 megaton Duke blowing up our atmosphere. Uh, good questions, Keith. Dave? Well, I'm sure that the, the Tsar Bomba contributed to that, but, you know, we shot off a bunch of them, too. In fact, Dominic was, was it, it's either 30 or 50. I can't remember off the top of my head, and I don't have my notes right in front of me. Uh, the, the atomic devices as well. The, the atomic atmospheric testing is a bad idea, but in that era, it was, you know, that's the way you sent a message, and they were sending messages back and forth. Yes, the Russians were trying to go to the moon, but they didn't have the motivation that we had. They have a very closed society. They have a very, you know, you don't have to convince the people in Russia to do anything. You just tell them what they're doing. And then as long as you tell them what you're doing, they pretend to work on it. And with predictable results, the first Soyuz capsule that went into space, the, the same Soyuz capsule, capsule that they fly today, by the way, did not work, and it killed the guy coming back. Burned him up in the atmosphere as he came back as he was yelling curses on the radio at the people that screwed the thing up. They, wow. they never got close to the moon. Uh, they did manage to land some some probes, but their their giant moon rocket, the N1, actually blew up on the pad, and they never really never really came close, and, and they still haven't. The Russians still have not. I mean, even even India has now landed a probe on the moon, as have the Chinese, but the Russians, they, they just never really had that motivation. They never really saw it the way we did. And, of course, that was to their detriment, I think, because it was a significant victory, air quote, air quote, in the Cold War. Very true. Line one, you're next on Bill Make Live. Good morning. Good morning. How are you? Very well. Make it quick, Claire. Okay. My birthday is July 20th. And they walked on the moon on my birthday. And three years later, I wound up living in Cocoa Beach. How about that? That's pretty cool. (laughs) Remember my birthday. You're going to sing happy birthday next year. No, I'm not. Claire, thank you. Line two, you're next on Bill Mick Live. Good morning. Uh, 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 Dave, uh, fantastic program. Um, Are you familiar with the... uh, Space Force uh, Museum uh, website and the History Center here in uh, Brevard County, by chance. I have not been to Brevard since 2006. So, I mean, I, I know that there is one, but I don't know that I've, I, I have not been there, now. Dave's aware he just hadn't been there is, is uh, what he's relating to us there. Appreciate the thought, though. You have to come out and visit, Dave. Well, I'll I'm even wait- come up with a spare room. Yeah, I'll I'm just waiting on a great there. invitation to come down there. So. Yeah. Well, not in hurricane right. season. Yeah, okay. We'll, we'll wait till after that season is over. One quick call before we're done. Line one, you're on Bill Mick Live. Good morning. Caller, go ahead. And that's why you got to be listening on the phone, not the radio. That's going to do it. Dave, in wrapping this up, it's brought us a lot of other innovation and taking us, uh, places and, and employment here for folks that, uh, wouldn't have existed had this not been going on. Yeah. I don't think people realize how, how, in the balance the space program was until that day and and again it wasn't that he was announcing the goal it was that he was saying get on board with the goal we've got to go and so the people did the americans responded scientists changed their minds well, maybe this is possible the undercurrent i'm hearing to this is that it was a politician doing politician things and it worked yeah much better than the politicians of today isn't that the truth dave bowman always a pleasure thank you my friend Thanks to the West Coco Pharmacy, they made the hour possible. What are we doing next week? George Washington's farewell address.
Very good with Dave next week. I'll see you tomorrow for Wide Open Wednesday. President Kitson, Mr. Vice President, Governor, Congressman Thomas, Senator Wiley and Congressman Miller, Mr. Webb, Mr. Bell, scientists, distinguished guests, uh, ladies and gentlemen. I appreciate uh, your president having made me an honorary visiting professor, and I will assure you that my first lecture will be uh, very brief. I am delighted to be here, and I'm particularly delighted to be here on this occasion. We meet at a college noted for knowledge, in a city noted for progress, in a state noted for strength, and we stand in need of all three. For we meet in an hour of change and challenge, in a decade of hope and fear, in an age of both knowledge and ignorance. The greater our knowledge increases, the greater our ignorance unfolds. Despite the striking fact that most of the scientists that the world has ever known are alive and working today, despite the fact that this nation's own scientific manpower is doubling every 12 years in a rate of growth more than three times that of our population as a whole. Despite that, the vast stretches of the unknown and the unanswered and the unfinished still far outstrip our collective comprehension. No man can fully grasp how far and how fast we have come but condense, if you will, the 50,000 years of man's recorded history in a time span of but a half a century. Stated in these terms, we know very little about the first 40 years, except at the end of them, advanced men had learned to use the skins of animals to cover them. Then about 10 years ago, under this standard, man emerged from his caves to construct other kinds of shelter. Only five years ago, man learned to write and use a cart with wheels. Christianity began less than two years ago. The printing press came this year. And then less than two months ago, during this whole 50-year span of human history, the steam engine provided a new source of power. Newton explored the meaning of gravity. Last month, electric lights and telephones and automobiles and airplanes became available. Only last week did we develop penicillin and television and nuclear power. And now, if America's new spacecraft succeeds in reaching Venus, we will have literally reached the stars before midnight tonight. This is a breathtaking pace, and such a pace cannot help but create new ills as it dispels old. New ignorance, new problems, new dangers. Surely the opening vistas of space promise high costs and hardships as well as high reward. So it is not surprising that some would have us stay where we are a little longer to rest, to wait. But this city of Houston, this state of Texas, this country of the United States was not built by those who waited and rested and wished to look behind them. <laughs> this country was conquered by those who move forward, and so will space. William Bradford, speaking in 1630 of the founding of the Plymouth Bay Colony, said that all great and honorable actions are accompanied with great difficulties, and both must be enterprised and overcome with answerable courage. If this capsule history of our progress teaches us anything, it is that man in his quest for knowledge and progress is determined and cannot be deterred. 
the exploration of space will go ahead, whether we join in it or not. And it is one of the great adventures of all time. And no nation which expects to be the leader of other nations can expect to stay behind in this race for space. Those who came before us made certain that this country rode the first waves of the Industrial Revolution, the first waves of modern invention, and the first wave of nuclear power. And this generation does not intend to founder in the backwash of the coming age of space. We mean to be a part of it. We mean to lead it. For the eyes of the world now look into space, to the moon and to the planets beyond. And we have vowed that we shall not see it governed by a hostile flag of conquest, but by a banner of freedom and peace. We have vowed that we shall not see space filled with weapons of mass destruction, but with instruments of knowledge and understanding. Yet the vows of this nation can only be fulfilled if we in this nation are first, and therefore we intend to be first. In short, our leadership in science and industry, our hopes for peace and security, our obligations to ourselves as well as others, all require us to make this effort, to solve these mysteries, to solve them for the good of all men, and to become the world's leading spacefaring nation. We set sail on this new sea because there is new knowledge to be gained and new rights to be won, and they must be won and used for the progress of all people. For space science, like nuclear science and all technology, has no conscience of its own. Whether it will become a force for good or ill depends on man. And only if the United States occupies a position of preeminence can we help decide whether this new ocean will be a sea of peace or a new terrifying theater of war. I do not say that we should or will go unprotected against the hostile misuse of space any more than we go unprotected against the hostile use of land or sea. But I do say that space can be explored and mastered without feeding the fires of war, without repeating the mistakes that man has made in extending his writ around this globe of ours. There is no strife, no prejudice, no national conflict in outer space as yet. Its hazards are hostile to us all. Its conquest deserves the best of all mankind. And its opportunity for peaceful cooperation may never come again. But why, some say, the moon? Why choose this as our goal? And they may well ask, why climb the highest mountain? Why, 35 years ago, fly the Atlantic? Why does Rice play Texas? We choose to go to the moon. We choose to go to the moon. We choose to go to the moon in this decade and do the other things, not because they are easy, but because they are hard. Because that goal will serve to organize and measure the best of our energies and skills. Because that challenge is one that we're willing to accept, one we are unwilling to postpone, and one we intend to win, and the others too. It is for these reasons that I regard the decision last year to shift our efforts in space from low to high gear as among the most important decisions that will be made during my incumbency in the office of the presidency. 
In the last 24 hours, we have seen facilities now being created for the greatest and most complex exploration in man's history. We have felt the ground shake and the air shattered by the testing of a Saturn C-1 booster rocket, many times as powerful as the Atlas which launched John Glenn, generating power equivalents to 10,000 automobiles with their accelerator on the floor. We have seen the site where five F-1 rocket engines, each one as powerful as all eight engines of the Saturn combined, will be clustered together to make the advanced Saturn missile. Assembled in a new building to be built at Cape Canaveral, as tall as a 48-story structure, as wide as a city block, and as long as two lengths of this field. Within these last 19 months, at least 45 satellites have circled the Earth. Some 40 of them were made in the United States of America, and they were far more sophisticated and supplied far more knowledge to the people of the world than those of the Soviet Union. The Mariner spacecraft... The Mariner spacecraft, now on its way to Venus, is the most intricate instrument in the history of space science. The accuracy of that shot is comparable to firing a missile from Cape Canaveral and dropping it in this stadium between the 40-yard lines. Transit satellites are helping our ships at sea to steer a safer course. Tyrus satellites have given us unprecedented warnings of hurricanes and storms and will do the same for forest fires and icebergs. We have had our failures, but so have others, even if they do not admit them, and they may be less public. To be sure, to be sure we are behind, and will be behind for some time in man flight. But we do not intend to stay behind, and in this decade we shall make up and move ahead. The growth of our science and education will be enriched by new knowledge of our universe and environment, by new techniques of learning and mapping and observation, by new tools and computers for industry, medicine, and the home, as well as the school. Technical institutions such as Rice will reap the harvest of these gains. And finally, the space effort itself, while still in its infancy, has already created a great number of new companies and tens of thousands of new jobs. Space and related industries are generating new demands in investment and skilled personnel. And this city and this state and this region will share greatly in this growth. What was once the furthest outpost on the old frontier of the West will be the furthest outpost on the new frontier of science and space. Houston. Your city of Houston, with its manned spacecraft center, will become the heart of a large scientific and engineering community. During the next five years, the National Aeronautic and Space Administration expects to double the number of scientists and engineers in this area to increase its outlays for salaries and expenses to $60 million a year, to invest some $200 million in plant and laboratory facilities, and to direct or contract for new space efforts over $1 billion from this center in this city. To be sure, all this costs us all a good deal of money. This year's space budget is three times what it was in January 1961 and it is greater than the space budget of the previous eight years combined. That budget now stands at $5,400,000,000 a year, a staggering sum, though somewhat less than we pay for cigarettes and cigars every year. Space expenditures... <laughs> space expenditures will soon rise some more 
from 40 cents per person per week to more than 50 cents a week for every man, woman, and child in the United States. For we have given this program a high national priority, even though I realize that this is, in some measure, an act of faith and vision. For we do not now know what benefits await us. But if I were to say, my fellow citizens, that we shall send to the moon 240,000 miles away from the control station in Houston, a giant rocket more than 300 feet tall, the length of this football field, made of new metal alloys, some of which have not yet been invented, capable of standing heat and stresses several times more than have ever been experienced, fitted together with a precision better than the finest watch, carrying all the equipment needed for propulsion, guidance, control, communications, food, and survival, on an untried mission to an unknown celestial body, and then return it safely to Earth, re-entering the atmosphere at speeds of over 25,000 miles per hour, causing heat about half that on the temperature of the sun, almost as hot as it is here today, and do all this, and do all this, and do it right, and do it first, before this dictate is out, then we must be bold. I'm the one who's doing all the work, so uh, we'll just watch to stay cool for a minute. However, I think we're going to do it. And I think that uh, we must pay what needs to be paid. I don't think we ought to waste any money, but I think we ought to do the job. And this will be done in the decade of the 60s. It may be done while some of you are still here at school at this college and university. It will be done during the terms of office of some of the people who sit here on this platform. But it will be done. And it will be done before the end of this decade. And I am delighted that this university is playing a part in putting a man on the moon as part of a great national effort of the United States of America. Many years ago, the great British explorer George Mallory, who was to die on Mount Everest, was asked why did he want to climb it. He said, because it is there. Well, space is there, and we're going to climb it. And the moon and the planets are there, and new hopes for knowledge and peace are there. And therefore, as we set sail, we ask God's blessing on the most hazardous and dangerous and greatest adventure on which man has ever embarked. Thank you.